Okay, welcome back to this 12th lecture, to this class. So we're basically halfway through. And I'll, today I'll do something different than usual. I'll do some, uh, something that you could call like geometry even, because I'm going to give a very quick introduction to vector bundles. Uh, I don't know the background of everyone. I expect some of you might have seen this material before. I hope it's not to be, to be too boring for you, uh, but just to be sure, I wanted to give a, a very uh, a very quick uh, introduction to this material because we're going to use it uh, next Thursday. And uh, yeah, I'll black box a couple of properties of paracompact Hausdorff spaces. Um, there, there is actually a proof in the notes that are online now. Uh, if you're really, really curious, but uh, yeah, I don't think it's very useful. So, okay, let's go with the main definition. So now let X be a topological space. So it's not an element of the infinity category of spaces here. We are actually a, a honest to God topological space. Um, a vector bundle um, X is a triple of E S mu, where P from E to X is a map of topological spaces. S from the fiber product of E itself. E is a, and mu from C times E into E are continuous maps over X. So these are maps of spaces over X, uh, such that it satisfies the following property. For every little X point of X, there exists U, a neighborhood of X, and C sorry, and V a uh, complex vector space and then uh, homeomorphism P inverse of U homomorphism to X times V over X. So that the, the map to X is the projection on the first component and there is isomorphism such that under this identification Um, what do we need? S of X V W is X of V plus W and uh, mu of lambda X V is X lambda V. Oh, sorry. Let me add a funny dimensional complex vector space here. Uh, and I, I see V as a topological space with the standard topology that complex vector spaces have. Um, so in particular, particular, each fiber EX is given a finite dimensional C vector space structure by S and mu. Okay. So I, this definition might be different from the one you're used to see. You might have seen uh, a definition by giving an atlas of charts and they're required to be compatible in some way, et cetera, et cetera. This is equivalent to this. I just prefer to, to, to give uh, the structure explicitly. In this case, it's given by SMU. And then you, you just ask some kind of local triviality. Oh, and these U are called typical, these are called trivialization of E. Okay. Um, this shouldn't be surprising. This is, if you've seen the definition of covering space, and I know you've seen it, uh, it's very similar. Uh, so, okay. And we're going to concentrate mainly for vector spaces, vector bundles when X is a part compact Hausdorff topological space. For example, 
a CW complex. Uh, in fact, we're going to, only going to care about CW complexes and spaces. But, uh, and these are technically complex vector bundles. You can give the analog the definition of real vector bundles. You can probably imagine how it goes. So I'm going to need this lemma about general topology, which I wrote a proof. It's on the notes, but I'm not going to prove it now. So if X is a paracompact, Hausdorff uh, topological space. And if you don't know what these words mean, well, what paracompact means, just take this lemma as a, one of the two properties of paracompact Hausdorff topological space that we're going to use. Uh, then for every UI open covering, there exists a countable open covering the n such that each the n is is the disjoint union of the n i with the n i open subset of u i the v n i's are are disjoint that's very important so that's Fairly easy uh, to prove uh, using the using the following fact that I'm also not going to prove uh, if X is a paracompact Hausdorff topological space. In fact, you can take this as definition of the second property. You can take this as a definition of paracompact Hausdorff for any UI open covering. There exists uh, psi i partition of unity. Subordinate to the covering. So I don't know if you've seen partitions of unity before, uh, but with, what does it mean? Uh, I.e. for every X in uh, not in UI, Psi I of X is zero. Oh, sorry, Psi I are continuous functions from X to the closed interval zero one. So for every x not in ui psi i of x is zero. For any x in x only finitely, sorry, there exists v a neighborhood of x such that the number of, of functions non-zero in the neighborhood is finite. So in the neighborhood, only finitely many of these psi i are non-zero. And uh, what was that? Oh yeah, <laughs> partitions of unity. So the sum of the psi i, which makes sense because in every, every point is a neighborhood where it's only a finite sum is one. That's, that's called a partition of unity. And this, in fact, this is completely characterized. A space is paracompact Hausdorff if and only if it has this property. And that's what people normally want to use. And using this property, there is a very short proof of the lemma above, which I'm not going to give you though. But uh, is, is this clear, this topological situation clear? As a corollary, if P E to X is a vector bundle uh, and X is paracompact, Hausdorff, then there exists Vn accountable cover of trivialization. Because you can find an open cover such that E is trivialized over every cover, but then you can apply uh, this lemma here uh, and find uh, such a countable open cover. And you can, well, if you have a trivialization on each disjoint, connected component of your VN, you can build them together to a trivialization. Okay. Oh, I didn't tell you what a map of vector bundles is. It's okay, one, one step at a time. Uh, so questions so far? This was a, a lot of general topology to drop in your lab, but...
Okay. So where do I want to go? Okay, yeah. So okay, a map of vector bundles is just a map e, e prime over x uh, respecting the vector space structure. That is uh, S of F times F is F composed with S and uh, I would want to say it mu of lambda F is F composed with mu lambda blank. You know, it, F of the sum is the sum of the F's and multiplication by a scalar. If you want to, another way of saying is that it's F is a C linear map when restricted to each fiber. Okay, and we will write pi zero vect x for the set of isoclasses of vector bundles on x. And it's pi zero because secretly there will be a space of vector bundles whose pi zero is the set of isoclasses, but for now it's just notation. More generally, the, the rank of a vector bundle uh, e to x is the function that goes from x to the non negative integers, sending x to the dimension over c of ex. And in fact, this is locally constant. as it's obvious from the, from the definition of a vector bundle, because on every point is a neighborhood where the, the isotype of the fiber is the same. So in fact, I will care only vector bundles of constant rank, but you know, just to be, to be clear. And okay, and we write uh, pi zero vect d side vect x for the subset of vector bundles of rank d. Okay, I think I'm going quite fast, so maybe I should stop for a second. See if anyone has questions. And when I say rank d, I mean the rank is the constant function d. Okay, so let me state the, theor the main theorem of today, which we're going to prove in two steps. Uh, the let X be a paracompact Hausdorff space. We'll write uh, that there is a natural bijection between Pi zero vect dx and homotopy classes of maps from x to b u d. Well, u d is the group of d by d. Sorry, is the topological group d by d. Uh, unitary matrices. I think you should all know what a unitary matrix is. Yes, maybe it was a long time ago that you saw the definition, but you know, a matrix whose inverse it's, uh, it's Hermitian transpose. Or if you want a matrix that respects the standard metric on C to the D. And uh, well, bolster by this theorem we will actually define like the X as the mapping space. And it turns out you can actually give a more intrinsic definition of this space uh, as uh, the, the coherent nerve of a canon reached groupoid of vector bundles. 
and turns out to be equivalent to these. And it's going to be an exercise, but I'm not going to prove it for now because I want to limit the technicalities and this theorem is all we need. But I mean, this definition is not completely crazy. Uh, okay. Is it clear what am I uh, aiming to prove for today? Have you ever seen this result before? No? Okay, good. So I'm not telling you old stuff. Uh, uh, it's a very, in a special case of a more general result, I think Pavel is going to hint at the more general result in the exercise session. Uh, but yeah, we're going to only do that. Oh, and I didn't say it, but all CW complexes are very complex house of. So in fact, we're only going to care about, in particular, all geometric realizations of, of simplicial sets are going to be uh, very compact out of. So. Very compact out of is very, very general. I think every metrizable space is very compact out of for every. You have to hunt a bit to find a space that's not very compact out of. Every manifold is very compact out of. Well, by definition, actually, it's part of the hypothesis of a manifold. Okay, is it clear? Can we start? So the first thing that we notice is that the right -hand side is manifestly homotopy invariant, because so it, the left hand side had better be uh, also homotopy invariant, and that's the first result I'm going to prove. So proposition let e through x times E, yeah, sorry, times uh, zero one, let's say the interval zero one be a vector bundle. Uh, then there exist. Then if we let, sorry, E prime to be E restricted to X times zero, uh, there's an isomorphism of vector bundles E, e prime times zero one. As a vector bundle over x times zero one. So this is as a corollary the isomorphism classes of vector bundles. Pi zero back blank is homotopy invariant. And how do you prove it? Well, proof. Uh, suppose you have. Uh, I want to say is homotopy invariant. Oh yeah. Uh, I want to say that suppose if I have f g from x to y uh, maps. Oh, uh, I didn't define the factoriality though. So. so actually, before that, let me say if I have f from x to y continuous map and e to y. A vector bundle f upper star e, which is just e times uh, y over x, the pullback is a vector bundle uh, with uh, the obvious uh, choices of s and mu. I mean, this is, doesn't change the fiber, so, so the c linear structure on the fiber is going to be the same. And that's well, okay, you can. See, it was an exercise, but it's really easy. The pre image of every trivialization in Y is a trivialization on X. So, okay. So, suppose you have maps that are homotopic. We want to show uh, F upper star of E is isomorphic to, sorry, g upper star of e for every e. That is what it means to be homotopy invariant. Well, OK, let h zero, 1 into y, uh, the homotopy, have a homotopy. Then h upper star of e is a vector bundle. Uh, 
And so, and uh, H upper star of E restricted to X tends zero is exactly F upper star of E. And H upper star of E restricted to X times one is G upper star of E. Uh, but by the proposition, they need to be isomorphic. Because E is the same thing as F upper star of E times a zero one, and then it's fiber over one is obviously the same as F upper star of E. Could you maybe explain explicitly what you mean by vector bundle times uh, interval? Uh, yeah, sorry. Actually, what I mean is, uh, well, I mean both literally. So if I have a vector bundle E prime over X, I can just take E prime times zero one over X times zero one. And that's a map. And okay, I haven't defined you what the S you write, but the point is that E prime times zero one fiber, for example, zero one prime times zero one is just E prime fiber times zero one. So, and the same thing, well, C times E prime times zero one is the same as C times E prime times zero one. So SMU are well defined. And I, but actually secretly is a special case of the, the map I already defined, because if I take PR from X tends zero one to X, the first projection, then these E prime times zero one is just PR upper star of E prime, the vector bundle. I just mean taking constant along the zero one direction. Okay. Okay. So this lemma is this proposition, sorry, is secretly saying exactly that the isomorphisms Gaussian vector bundles over X and zero one are all pulled back along the projection, which means when you unwrap everything, as in this corollary, that by zero vet is homotopy invariant. Is it okay? So let me start the proof of this proposition. This is unfortunately rather technical. It goes in various steps. So remember, we have E to X times zero one a vector bundle. And the first step is that we can find the trivialization that are big. So step one, for each X in X, there exists a U neighborhood of X in X uh, and trivialization of E restricted to U times zero one. So let me see X times zero one. I can trivialize things in, in big strips. And okay, how do we do that? Uh, well, for every T in zero one, we can find U, uh, UT neighborhood of X and a trivialize and uh, epsilon t uh, trivialization, uh, sorry, an epsilon t greater than zero, such that uh, there exists a trivialization on ut times t minus epsilon t plus epsilon. Like since every neighborhood of x comma t is, is 
contains a smaller neighborhood of this form. I can find it like that. And okay, uh, since x times zero one is compact, we can find t1, tn such that u t1 times t1 minus epsilon t1. Sorry, I forgot that this was epsilon t. t plus epsilon t1, etc. cover x uh, times 0, 1. And OK, now let u to be the intersection. and epsilon to be the minimum as usual. You can always restrict it. It's still going to be a neighborhood. And now we have just a bunch of squares with a trivialization. And so essentially what we have, we have uh, T0 is 0, less than T1, less than Tn, which is 1. And trivialization of E on U times Ti, Ti plus 1. But then we can do the trivialization. Inductively. And we obtain trivialization. So you start with the trivialization over uh, zero to t one, and then this trivialization might be might be different by automorphisms on the on the restriction on x times t one. Uh, sorry, on u times t one. But you can use this automorphism to change the trivialization. So let me maybe be explicit about how you do it. So let me do the first step. So we have a trivialization. So we have uh, the inverse of u zero t one. It has a morphic to some v times u times zero t one, and then we have. So let me call this phi one, and this is called phi two. T one t two of v times u times t1, t2. And the v needs to be the same uh, because you can check on a fiber on, on, on a point, so say x comma t1. And v, I can take v to be the fiber on x comma t1, for example. Since v is isomorphic to all fibers, I can identify them. OK, that's great. Uh, now, uh, what do you want to say? Yes. In particular, we get a map, a composition. So you have V times U is isomorphic to V times U times T1. That uh, uh, is isomorphic to the pre-image of u times uh, t1 in um, using phi to inverse. And then this isomorphic using phi1 to v times u times t1, which is again v times u. And this map is not necessarily the identity because I have no compatibility of phi1 and phi2. But then, OK, I'll let me call this map F. And then if I take, then I can take F composed with phi2, by which I mean, sorry, F times the identity composed with phi2 on the last component. And I call this, let's say, phi2 prime. And now I have that phi two prime restricted to P inverse of U times T one is equal to phi one by 
by construction. Because that's how I built phi two prime. And so I can glue them together and get uh, phi from the inverse of u times zero t2 to v times u times zero t2. It's just, uh, it's the same proof as the unique lifting property for covering spaces, if you remember. Essentially, intervals are easy. You can do one step at a time. And then you can go inductively until you get to Tn. Okay, so this was the easy step. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is this proof is going to be, but okay, to, to, to boil down, we have this cone So we have this step one. We have this cone. Uh, trivialization, this fat trivialization. So, therefore, we can find ui cover of x such that, and, and trivialization of x e restricted, sorry, to ui times 0, 1. But then by the lemma, maybe we can find Vn countable cover of x and the trivial and trivialization Vn yeah, sorry Vn is it? because as usual you know you find you find this cover such that it, every element is a disjoint union of subset of some UI, and then you use the trivializations on the UI to build this trivialization here. Okay. Now, let psi n a partition of unity. Uh, subordinate to this cover and let capital Psi N to be just Psi zero plus Psi N. So this is a sequence, you know, you start with zero, less than Psi zero, less than Psi one, etc., And the supremum is going to be one. Do you want the uh, um, cover to be countable? Have you said that? Uh, I said, count, sorry, countable cover. I mean, the Vn is the cover given by this lemma. That's why I want it to be countable, actually. That, that's what, because I want to do this, this trick. Uh, OK. Now, OK, we are here we have this. So what do we want? Remember, we want an ISO e, e prime times zero one. And now this is going to be an ISO over X times zero one. So it's mandated what it's going to do on the second component. So what we want, a map E to E prime over X which uh, is an ISO E X comma T E prime X for every T. 
and X on, on fibers. Sorry, I should say it's annoying, but it's not really fibers over X because you need to take the fibers over X times a zero one for E. So that's what we want. And that's what we're going to construct. So we're going to do it inductively on the cover. So we let Xn to be X in X such that, sorry, no, not X in X, Xt in X times zero one, such that uh, T is less or equal than capital Phi N of X. I have this thing, it's a sub closed subspace of zero one. And it's in fact, it's a locally finite closed cover. of x times zero one. It's locally finite because remember for any point only finitely many of the of the uh, psi n where no zero of the lowercase psi n. So psi n for every point x the is a neighborhood such that psi n is eventually constant on that neighborhood. is eventually one, so. Okay. You can think of it as, you know, take the graphs of this big psi n that tend to one in an increasing way in this cover. So this is xn. It's the, the, the area below the graph. And we're going to construct a map Fn from E restricted to Xn into E prime with the above property. For every N. And then use the fact in a compatible way. And then use the fact that if you have a map such that the restriction to, to every set of a locally finite closed cover is continuous, then the global map is continuous. This is a, I, I think it was like the very first exercise that was given in my uh, general topology class, actually, many, many years ago. Uh, but the point is, the, the, the idea is I'm going to do one graph at a time. And since this is a partition of unity, in the end, this graph is going to cover everything. So we start with x minus one. Well, x minus one is just x times zero since psi minus one is zero. So, and here, well, E restricted to X minus one is E prime. So we take F minus one to be the identity. Okay, good. Uh, that was easy. And now suppose we did for, we did Fn, we need to construct Xn and we need to construct the Fn plus one. And here is the point why I introduced this Xn. So there are two important properties. So the inclusion Xn into Xn plus one has a retraction. Xn plus one into Xn over X that fixes the, the X component. So this sends X comma T to x comma the maximum between psi n of x and uh, the minimum, sorry. Like in, in, in this graph, I'm just sliding until I hit the next graph. So that's a continuous retraction. And moreover, the other property, which is more important even, is that xn plus one minus xn is contained 
in Vn times 0, 1, where I had a trivialization of my E. Why is that so? Well, because if you have x comma t here, this means that psi m plus one of x is greater or equal than t, which is greater than psi n of x. So in particular, this means that little psi n of x is non zero because that's the difference. And so x is in Vn by the partitions of unity. Okay. And so, uh, well, we have a trivialization now. Uh, of E restricted to Vn times zero, which now I realize that my choice of V for the vector space is unfortunate, but uh, I'll, I'll, for consistency sake, I'll, I'll keep on it. Uh, and so here you can get a map to E restricted to V, sorry, Vn plus one. This was Vn plus one. But then, of course, uh, Vn plus one. So we can get a map E to Vn plus one to E restricted to Vn uh, retraction about Xn plus one to Xn. Like, let me call this R n plus one. Right, this is a, a retraction above my a retraction that I had. It's just applying the retraction on the second component and the identity on the first component. And therefore, I can glue it together with the identity and get a retraction of E restricted to e Xn plus one to E restricted to Xn. Actually, I'm going to call these also around this one. And then we let Fn plus one to be the composite. X, uh, sorry, E restricted to Xn plus one goes to E restricted to Xn goes to E prime with Fn. And we are done. And this was the end of the proof of homotopy invariance. Sorry if it was more technical. The next one is going to be easier. The next important lemma, and then we're going to go back to do homotopical stuff. Questions about this proof? It's a bit magic, but if you try to write it down, you see that you're just doing it well. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's still going to be look magic even after you've wrote it for themselves, but it's hopefully going to be more understandable. Uh, I don't know how people invent these proofs, honestly, but some people seem to be able to. Okay, the following lemma is a lot easier. Thankfully. The following lemma is, uh, so suppose that P from E to X vector bundle and X as usual paracompact Hausdorff, then there exists a map from E to C infinity, a C linear in each fiber, C linear and injective, sorry. On each fiber. And actually, maybe I should say what I mean by C infinity. C infinity is the union of Cn for every n, that is the sequences 
sorry, C to the N, such that Xn is zero for almost all N. I don't know if you've seen this space before. It's a C vector. It's just a C vector space with a countable basis. But this way, I'm, I'm actually telling you what the topology is, is the inductive limit topology on this unit. And technically, you should think of it as an int vector space or whatever, but I'm not going to, to play these kind of games. Uh, think of it like a topological vector space. It's not complete, very far from complete, of course, but I don't care. Okay, and this is saying every vector bundle can be embedding. You can find that, in a sense, this is telling you that you can find a continuous embedding of every fiber into C infinity in a way that varies continuously on X. And moreover, if X is compact, we can find F from E to some finite stage. So things for which only the first N components are non-zero. I find this proof is very, very easy. Uh, so the idea let UN be a countable uh, trivialization of, of E. Uh, then for every N, uh, we have in particular maps from E restricted to UN into C to some DN. It's not very important. It's probably going, in general, it's going to be like probably constant, but you know, if X has various connected components, the rank can vary and jump from connected component to connected component. Uh, sorry, I should say ISO on each fiber. Oh, it's just the projection of the trivialization. Okay, let psi n partition of unity as usual. And then the map f from x to c infinity is exactly what you would think it is. It's this map f of e is psi 0 p of e times, uh, oh, sorry, let me call them f n. F zero of E, psi one P of E times F one of E, etc. In C of D zero plus D one plus etc. That is in C infinity. And these make sense because it's true that F i is defined only in U i, but outside of U i, this guy is uh, zero. So I'm taking just the zero. I'm extending by zero this continuous map. So this actually makes sense. And for every E, only finitely many of these are non zero. So this actually lands into C infinity. And for every E, one of these components is an ISO on the fiber, because this, this number is non zero. And if, uh, if X is compact, I can just choose finitely many UNs. And this gives me the final statement I was looking for. Okay. So this is a very explicit uh, construction. Questions about this? And this is the general statements about vector bundles I wanted to say. And now I think I have 
40 minutes, it should be enough to do at least the first half of the proof of the theorem. And then we'll see how much time do we have, otherwise we're going to finish it on Thursday. Question about this? Questions about this? So remember, we have these two statements. First, that vector bundles are homotopy invariant. And second, that vector bundles, as I say, have complements in some sense. You can embed them into constant vector bundles in some level. So for example, when X is compact, this gives you an, an embeddings an embedding, sorry, of vector bundles into a trivial vector bundle. And that's also the same even X is not compact, that's how you should think of it. Uh, it's just that a finite a dimensional vector bundle can might not be enough. So you have this X times C infinity. And let me give you an exercise. So if Z into X is a co-fibration, you can choose F as above, uh, agreeing with a given F zero from E restricted to Z. So if you have a co-fibration, remember it's a, sorry, closed co-fibration, I should say. But we are in paracompact house of spaces, so it's, I think all cofibrations are always closed in house of spaces. Uh, so if you have a closed subset, a sufficiently nice closed subset, you can ask this f to agree with something. Uh, we're not going to use this, but I think it's a, it's it's an exercise to understand a little, a little bit how this proof works. Okay. So okay. Now let M uh, infinity C as a subspace of the product of N times N C be the space of C linear maps from C infinity to C infinity. So a, a C linear map is represented by uh, some big matrix as usual. And they're not all the matrices. Technically, you need all the columns to have only finitely non zero entries. Otherwise, the, the, the image of an element in C infinity is not necessarily in C infinity. You need the sums to be finite. But I'm topologizing it. If you want, another way of saying it is that you can topologize it as the limit. Well, no, I'm not going to. So, to be more precise, actually. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you can compose them and you have, for example, for every A in an in infinity C, uh, you can have a notion of conjugate transpose, as usual, and just transpose it. This actually works only if A has finitely many non-zero horizontal entries. Every row has finitely many non-zero entries, but I'm going to write A transpose conjugate only in the case in which A is actually uh, not always, but we'll write it, oof, we'll write it only in this case. And okay, now it's time for definition of the, the object that's going to be the important part, which is the d-dimensional Grassmannian. That's the space of all P and infinity C, such that the rank of P, I mean the dimension of its image, it's D, it's finite and it's D. Uh, P square is P, is a projection, and it's an orthogonal projection. So maybe, I'm not sure if you remember it from when you did linear algebra, every uh, vector subspace always has an ortho orthogonal projection and the rank of the orthogonal projection is equivalent to the thing. And in fact, this is also the trace. 
of the orthogonal projection because orthogonal projections have eigenvalues only zero and one. So the tree is exactly the same as the rank. But okay, that's a minor point just to show that the rank is a continuous function on, on these matrices because it's a restriction of the trace. Yeah. Okay, and we, we think of it this as the space of v dimensional subspaces of C infinity. Since there is a bijection between the points of this space and d dimensional subspaces of C infinity. And uh, I'm going to give you an exercise to, to understand a little bit how this works. So let V in GRD, I mean a d dimensional subspace, i.e., a d dimensional subspace of C infinity, we have a map from the C linear homomorphism from V to V orthogonal into GRD that sends F to the gra uh, graph of F in V plus V orthogonal C infinity. That is the subspace of the subspace here, which is also the dimensional subspace. And okay, that's I have a map. I just defined it for you. It's a map of sets. And the claim is show that this is uh, an open embedding with image those W in GRD such that the projection is subjective. The orthogonal projection is subjective from W to V. And this description is actually, the description um, tells you that the, the subset is open because if you write it in terms of projections, this is saying the trace of P dub, uh, PV, PW is V. And that's an open condition. No, sorry, that the rank, I should say. Well, greater or equal than D, really, but OK. And that's an open condition. That's the, the non-vanishing of a bunch of determinants. So this, this tells you that this subset is open. You just need to show that it's a homeomorphism with this subset here. And that's going to be useful. That's called the standard, uh, standard charts in the Grassmannian. I'll, I'll let you to do the exercise of finding the inverse of this map. It's uh, less hard than you would think. Uh, but we're going to use it because we're going to, to show, need to show that a bunch of stuff is a fiber bundle over the Grassmannian. And uh, they're going to be trivialized by these open subsets. Uh, is this exercise clear? Okay, good. This Grassmannian secretive will be a model for BUD, by the way. Uh, that's why I'm introducing it. A geometric model for BUD. But that, that proof, I don't think we're going to get to that proof later. But we can do the first part. So we have, so definition, the tautological bundle Psi D over the D dimensional Grassmannian is the space Psi D 
in C, uh, sorry, in C infinity times the Grassmannian. So given by V comma V such that V is in V. Or if you want to think in terms of P of the projections, which is how I topologized, I have this condition here. That's what it means to lay in the subspace. So it's actually an, it's actually a well-defined closed subscheme of the sub, sub, sorry, closed subspace of this C infinity times GRP. So okay, and uh, why did I call it a logical bundle? Well, because it is a vector bundle. This is a vector bundle trivialized by the standard basis. And it's tautological because the fiber over V is exactly V. And in fact, you can, you can see that psi V restricted to home V, the orthogonal in the standard basis is V times home V, the orthogonal. And uh, ah, the, the, the vector space structure on the fiber is given just by acting on this component, just by summing and multiplying by scalar on this component. You can see that this is, you know, you have VF, you go to, you know, graph of F comma F of V, sorry, V comma F of V. This gives you a bijection. And now, uh, I hope I'll have the time to prove this theorem. Well, we'll see. Is, this, is the definition of a topological bundle clear? It's just a bundle that to every point on the Grassmannian, the fiber above is the vector space corresponding to that point. That's why it's called the topological bundle. And the theorem is that the map from homotopy classes of maps into the Grassmannian to phi zero vect x sending f to the pullback of psi d is a bijection. So you can think if you're a vector bundle, somehow that this map from X to the Grassmannian, you can think of it as sending every point to the fiber over that point, morally. Let's see how this goes. So first, this is well-defined because pullbacks are homotopy invariants. Find by homotopy invariance. And now, okay. Now the question is what does it mean to give, so let E to X be a vector bundle. Ooh. Sorry, vector bundles of, of, of rank D, of course. You can only get vector bundles of rank D in this, in this way, right? Because psi D is a vector bundle of ranks D by, by construction. So, yeah. For the first sentence, you use something, right? Maybe that the vector bundle is always a preparation or something like that? No, 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 no. I'm using that the pullback of a vector bundle is a vector bundle. Yeah, but for homotopy invariance. So, sorry, when I mean homotopy invariance, I mean that by zero, that if F and G are homotopic, this means that F upper star of psi D is homotopy equivalent to G upper star of psi D. Sorry, not homotopy equivalent, it's isomorphic, which is uh, the result that we, the first result we proved today. Remember? Let me go back to where we did. Okay, this was the very technical proof that we used, but we have this corollary. So we have two maps that are homotopic. We want to show that the, the pullback of the same vector bundle are isomorphic. 
So that's what I mean by homotopy invariance, and that's what I mean that the map is well defined by homotopy invariance. Okay. Okay, so now we have a vector bundle. So what does it mean to give a map that to give an isomorphism like this? Well, remember, phi upper star psi d is exactly the, this fiber product. So giving, certainly giving a map from E to F upper star psi d. So a map E to F upper star psi d is a, a map like this. And to say it's an isomorphism, it means that phi is an isomorphism on every, on every fiber. And remember, this is a subspace here. So giving phi is the same as giving, say, f tilde from E to C infinity, such that F tilde of EX of the fiber, the image of the fiber over EX is exactly the subspace F of X. Uh, and sorry, and phi tilde is injective. Because we don't want to lose rank. So note that this in particular tells you that F tilde determines F. So a pair F and e psi D is the same thing as a map. F tilde from E to C infinity, as, which is a C linear embedding on each fiber. Ha, huh. but wait a second. Didn't we just prove that for every vector bundle there is one of those? We did, right? So, in particular, this map x g r d to pi zero vect x is surjective. Okay, that's great. Uh, we only have to do injectivity and then we're done. I just wish injectivity were simple. Uh, it's not. It's not too complicated. Right? And using the same reasoning, this boils down injectivity boils down to show that if we have F tilde, G tilde, any map, which is an embedding on each fiber, then they are homotopic. And in fact, this is a consequence of that exercise I gave you. So I'll give you a different proof here, but I'll just show you how this exercise uh, works. Uh, you could deduce it, you could see this as extending a map from E times the border of the one simplex to E times the one simplex. 
right? This, this map from E to the border of one simplex is just a, a pair of maps, which are S tilde and G tilde. So these are going to be my, so X times the border is going to be my Z, and this is going to be in, in X times delta one. So this actually follows from the, the, the exercise I gave you. But I'm going to give you a different proof, an explicit proof here. So, okay, so we have S tilde and G tilde, and we want to show that they are homotopic. So first of all, well, we have uh, a homotopy uh, zero one times C infinity into C infinity, sending T comma X dot to T X zero, X one, etc. plus one minus T X zero, zero, X one, zero, etc. You have this homotopy that's moving everything uh, to the even number the coordinates. And it, it's a homotopy through embeddings. You can check that this map is an embedding, a linear embedding for every T. It's injective for every T. That I leave you as an exercise to you. Sorry, it's, it's a little not hard. And we also have so that we have this, and we also have this x prime, h prime. which is its little brother that moves you in the odd dimensional coordinates. Uh, the odd number coordinates. Okay. So by taking H F tilde and H prime G tilde, we can assume F has values only on the even the uh, numbered coordinates. Uh, sorry, F tilde and G tilde has values only on the odd numbered coordinates. Right, I can homotopy them through embeddings. Okay, but then, but then T F tilde plus one minus T G tilde is the homotopy we were looking for because it's going to be injective for every T since F tilde and G tilde do not speak to each other. And that actually ends the proof of the representability result. I went a little faster than perhaps I thought. I might be able to even prove the homotopy equivalence of GRD with BUD, but uh, other questions about this proof. And okay, let me do um, as more. Yes. So did we ever use the property of GRD that um, 
the complex conjugate transpose for P is P again. And yeah, it's just to get a bijection with between projections and, and vector space, subspaces. Ah, so we use this. I, I am secretly thinking of GRD as the set of all subspaces of rank D of C infinity and just using the projection description to uh, to give you a topology on that on that set. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you actually should check that a bunch of maps that I told you to be continuous actually are continuous. Uh, but, but with the projection description is very, very easy. That's why I've chosen it. And that's why I'm sort of skipping through it. You can just unwrap what it means and see that it does. So, okay. So we have pi zero vect dx is the same thing as multiple courses of maps from X to GRD. And in fact, uh, the view of an excess, well, it's not really an exercise, it's more a remark, but that X is homotopy classes of maps from X to the disjoint union of GRD. That's because in each connected component, a vector bundle has a well-defined rank since the rank is locally constant. And so, and you know that every map like these factors through one of these summons on one connected component, on each connected component it factors. Okay. Good. Okay. The next thing we want to say, I want to say, so the next theorem I want to say is uh, GRD is actually equivalent to BUD. Or pretty much equivalently, the loop space of GRD is UD as an E1 group. It's multiplication given by the multiplication of matrices. Okay, technically, you have to show that GRD is connected for this to be true, but and choose a base point, but okay, that's going to be. That's going to be the easier part, show that GRD is connected. Uh, the, the important part. Yes. So to do that, I'm going to use a lemma that is very useful. And in fact, it proves a more general version of this result I'm talking about. So let G be a topological group. And I think I'm going to prove only this lemma and then I'll let the show the application of this lemma. Uh, P from E to be a vibration with E contractible. And assume G acts on E over B by which I mean that every map, every element of G is a map from E to E over B. It preserves the projection on B, i.e. this commute. And that the action is simply transitive on each fiber, by which I mean something slightly stronger than literally the action is simply transitive in each fiber. I mean that the map G tends E to the fiber product given by this G E comma E is a homeomorphism. In fact, you only need, you need less than this, but let me ask for this stronger condition. Uh, then there exists a homotopy equivalent, an equivalence, sorry, of E1 spaces, G and loop space for, for any point. Oh, sorry, I should say subjective vibration, otherwise it won't work. when B is any point. I mean, I just need any point on the image of B, really. I 
mean, and, ju and just the, the surjectivity condition is just B might have some connected component that receives no, no element of E, and that's, that's crap. We don't want that. So one thing, the first thing is to notice that if we wanted only uh, an equivalence of spaces, it would be easy. Because uh, G is equivalent to the fiber over EB just by picking E on this fiber and, and taking the map G to EB, G goes to G. Which is an equivalence because it's an equivalence on, on the fiber over, uh, over E of the projection to E, on the second projection to E here. It's, an, it's, it's actually a homeomorphism. And so you have a we have a pullback square pullback in top, but it's a homotopy pullback because P is a vibration. That's exactly the only reason why we want P to be a vibration. So G is equivalent to the loop space since E is contractible. You know, this is equivalent to a point. And the proof that it's a map of E1 spaces is essentially the same proof, only done more carefully. But it's clear, the, this, this, is this proof clear? Okay, and uh, uh, okay, so now let's do the proof in the general case, checking that the group structure is also the same. So that multiplication in G corresponds to concatenation of loops. And the point is that I define this guy here, as you remember, the limit of this diagram and I can also write it actually as, as this fiber product. I think we discussed at some point that this is the same as this iterated fiber product and this is our homotopy pullbacks in this definition of course strict pullbacks would be just a point and then, since E is contractible and P is a vibration, it's this simplicial space here. But now, by induction, using G times E is equivalent to this fiber product, we see Omega B N is going to be G times G times G N times times E. And E was contractible, remember? And that's G times G. And actually, you have to check that the maps are the same as the maps that I'm claiming you, but everything is explicit. So this is, remember, this is just G brackets N. When you identify uh, G, G the, you know, community monoid in the classical sense with this coherent notion of community monoid. And you actually have to check that this is natural in N. 
I, have, I haven't technically spelled it out, but all the maps are completely explicit. So you can see that the maps are indeed the same maps for G and for omega B. Okay. Oh, and when I say vibration, sorry, throughout I mean star vibration. That's okay. We're working basically with CW complexes, so there is no difference. If you remember, there was some difference in the general case that I'm going to happily ignore for now. Yeah. And also in the following. Okay, is this proof clear? It's essentially the same proof of the proof of the level of spaces, just done carefully for every n, and see what what, what happens. I feel I, I'll be embarrassed. I had to ask someone to help me find this proof because I was, I knew it existed. I just couldn't reconstruct it on my own. So if it seems magic, don't be too surprised. And okay, I don't think I I have the time, but I just say okay next time. We'll construct a fiber bundle VB in over GRD and I use the action on VB. That satisfies the hypothesis of the lemma. And this is, if you've ever seen it before, this is going to be the Stiefel manifold, the infinite Stiefel manifold, which is not a manifold anymore, actually. but. Uh, it's more like in the manifold, but like you take a union of manifolds of bigger and bigger dimension until you get this thing. Um, and yeah, I don't think I, I can reasonably give you the proof. I mean, I can give you a definition of BD actually. That's kind of easy. BD is just the space of embeddings of CD in C infinity. And it has a map to GRD, sending an embedding to its image. Sorry, I mean uh, isometric embeddings. And if you want, if you want to take the 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 the, the projection model to see that this map is actually continuous, this is just saying f sending f to f h times f. No, sorry, f times f h ish. Okay, that's always well, whichever goes from c infinity to c infinity because you want a projection. So you see that indeed this map is obviously continuous. That's why I like the projection model because it allows you always to do these things in a very simple way. But that's of course now how you think. I mean, you think of this map as sending f to its image. And okay, and this turns out indeed to be um, um, contractible. And the, the action by UD actually, should, at this point, I could tell you the action UD is by precomposition. And you can indeed check that it satisfies all the hypotheses on the lemma very easily. Uh, but okay, you need to prove that VD is, is contractible, which is slightly long, so I'll leave it for next time. Okay. And maybe you've seen this contractibility statement already because in the case when D is one, V1 is just S infinity, the unit sphere in C infinity, because it, it's determined only by the value of the first basis vector. The image of the first basis vector determines the asymmetric embedding. And maybe you've seen this already that this is, I think we might have discussed it last semester. I'm not sure if I remember it, maybe not, but okay. Anyway, this unit sphere is, is contractible. And it's going to be a consequence. It's going to be needed to do one of the exercises that I, 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 I put on this morning. Uh, you can take it as for granted. I'm going to prove it on Thursday anyway, that this thing is contractible. So if you've never seen it before. OK, I think that's all I have.
maybe is there a connection between the fact that um, vibra uh, fiber bundles are vibration for paracompacts, host of spaces, and um, the homotopy invariance of uh, vector yes. bundles? I mean, to be precise, the connection is uh, this lemma I skipped here. This lemma that you can find for any covering. The general theorem says that if you have a countable fiber bundle over any space, then it is a self vibration. Sorry, then it's a it's a Hurelis vibration. Uh, countable, I mean a fiber bundle that has a countable trivialization. And uh, use this lemma to, to reduce to that case. And uh, yeah, the argument is the argument for this theorem that I'm claiming is not that different from the homotopy invariance. It's it's one of those things where you have to. Now I don't remember the details, but essentially you use the fact that you can lift stuff uh, on on trivialized things, and you you build it. Uh, inductively and you use the countability to do an induction argument that's the point as i did it for for constructing this trivialization here where it, where was it uh here this oh, this yeah this this xn you do the countability to do an induction in the building like a lift in this case you have to prove a homotopy lifting property right so you have to prove a lift on bigger and bigger things Induction. And that's the, the kind of arguments that appear. You know, if you ask me the details, I'm unprepared. I don't remember the details of that proof. But it's the, the, the flavor of the argument is not that different, I guess that's the point. But there is not a way to use the um, statement about vibrations to prove this uh, statement. No, you know. there is a more general statement that tells you that for any topological sufficiently nice topological group G, uh, G torsors or what are called principal G bundles are homotopy invariant, which I think Pavel is going to, to give us an example on Wednesday. And that's actually the, uh, the general statement that, uh, uh, that is going to be interesting. That, but okay, I, I, I don't, didn't want to define a principal G bundle and prove that principal U and bundles are the same thing as vector bundles and etc. because uh, just in the interest of time. But of course, there is a bigger story behind this. Uh, if you, this is typically done often in differential geometry classes, I think, this kind of arguments, because they're used to build connections on, on bundles and stuff like that. Of course, it's, interest of, it's interesting also for other reasons. I don't know if when people are supposed to learn about vector bundles, by the way. I think at some point people are expected to know what they are and how they behave, uh, but it's not clear to me in which class you're right. Probably differential geometries, so they're often mentioned because you need a tangent bundle. And so I don't think they're going to prove, I don't think it's usual, usual to prove this, this theorem here. Which is a very important theorem on some level. I, I wish I had time to talk about characteristic classes, but, which are studied by this theorem, but I don't. I'm just going to be able to introduce topological K theory, which I'm going to do next time. Okay, other questions? If not, I'll stop the recording.